my apologies for being a bit late. Um, this is an act from the crowd. I can see that most people appreciate the importance of today's seminar. I guess we all, it's, it, it's inarguable that archives are the repositories of a great deal of information. As such, an archivist plays a very important role in an academic institution. You must not only order or place the, the information in a particular order, you must be able to find it. And you must guide people through it. Uh, I met Helena when I discussed her project for her, with the, a project she had planned, and I'm deliberately mentioning this because I haven't heard from her since. A quite interesting project that she planned, but um, that spoke to her, her experience as an archivist, and it required gathering the current information, but probably it was based on what she had extracted from pouring through the documents that she had so carefully archived. But, um, so let me not ramble on. I would like, I am very interested in hearing how an archivist is able to keep track and manage all of this data because if they're not able to do that successfully, as we say in Trinidad, then all fall down. So without further ado, let me um, introduce Ms. Helena Leonce. 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 And maybe in the course of a discussion, we will hear something about some of the research she wanted to conduct. I don't know if you were planning to talk about it. No, I but, was not. Well, I'm going, to weave my, I'm going to weave my question along it because it was important research. She was going to be looking at the youths in, in, in MOVA and Laboratories. Yes. Right. And we all recognize the importance of that. So maybe out of today's discussion, something about that would come. She's wringing my hands, right? Yeah. <laughs> How many of you have experience or know anything at all about archives? Now the general consensus is, you know, when you go about, I have visited almost all the institutes and campuses of UTT, and most of them feel that archives is when you run out of space, you find somewhere to put it. Okay, so it's any kind of record, old records, records they don't want again, records that are filling up their active location at that point in time. But what really are archives? They are records, as you can see, selected and preserved for their continuing administrative, evidential, legal, fiscal, historical, intrinsic, or cultural value. In other words, they are records that you want to guard with your life. You don't have fly rest on it. You want to ensure that you preserve these records for as long as is humanly possible. Access to archival records, as it says, is provided in archival institutions and is supervised by an archivist. But all records are not archives because not every record you will want to keep forever and ever. Amen. Some records, you just need them for a short period of time and they can be destroyed. And there are other records that you may just need for a certain period of time and they can then perhaps be sent to an archival repository or perhaps remain for another period of time after review in a record center. Now the Americans like to say that 10% of an organization's records are archival and this is true. We are usually, including myself, like pack rats. We want to keep everything that we create. But it's different though in a university setting because a university creates even much more than some other organizations. You know, there are students coming in every year, thousands of students on a regular basis. So hence the, the additional accrual of records. 
Most national governments and other official bodies, as they say, preserve it because of the national heritage. Now you want to know, for example, at the National Archives you have the slave records, you have East Indian records, you have records from since the colonial government and things of that nature, where people will come in and do research. But in university settings, you know, you will keep students' transcripts and even as your own personal life. You want to know that if you have done an exam, your certificates, you want to know that you can have it. If you, if you are required to access it at some point in time. So you will need to preserve it. That is considered an archival record. Your birth certificate is considered an archival record. So in other words, again, any record that you want to really preserve and keep for as long as humanly possible is considered an archival record. Some people will say they're going to the archives. So they refer to the institution, to the building, as an archive. Access to this, as I said before, is done by a trained archivist. I love this quote. It says, of all national assets, archives are the most precious. Not everybody feel that way. Eh? <laughs> because one minister once told me that archives don't generate revenue, so we keep an empty for. But they are the gift of one generation to another. And the extent of our care of them marks the extent of our civilization. Could you imagine if you, are, if you were to trace your roots and there is nothing? Nothing that tells you who was here before. One of, a member of my staff is doing research on the Santa Rosa Caribs. Now, if everything pertaining to the Santa Rosa Caribs were destroyed, will she be able to, for you self or your generation, to really see and have an understanding of what our historical, what our heritage is all about? These are some of the laws which impact on archives and records management. The Freedom of Information Act, although the Freedom of Information Act did not take into consideration retention schedules. How long do we keep these records? When the Freedom of Information Act was created, formulated, they did not have anybody putting into archives in that committee. And that was a mistake, because now when people hear Freedom of Information Act, oh God, we had to keep everything. So every single thing is being kept and everything is not, it is not necessary to keep everything. <laughs> the Exchequer and Audit Act, Chapter 6901. Well, that is the only, within that, the laws of Trinidad and Tobago that deals with some sort of retention and some sort of and records information pertaining to records because it tells you about accounting records, how long you're going to keep vouchers, ledgers, receipts, and things of that nature. Additionally, it tells you that any official government record, the approval to destroy any official government record is only given by the government archivists of Trinidad and Tobago. So when people delete, they burn, they shred, Official records, that's against the law. But of course you may know about the Copyright Act. We don't want to take anybody's work and use it for our own personal uses without first getting the required permission. The Electronic Act, we are going green. Everybody's talking about going green. But we need to know also what records should be retained forever and ever, what records can quite comfortably and it's quite legal to delete the Data Protection Act. How are we protecting our data? What rights do we have with respect to this act? So I, there are a number of slides, so I just want to go quickly. What I want to also say is anybody who feel they need, they would like a copy of my presentation, you can email me and I'll send it to you. <coughs> These are archival activities, acquisition, appraisal, arrangement, and description, preservation, storage, reference. But all these are activities that happens in an archival setting in an institution, an archival institution, in an archival repository. Acquisition where you include records, perhaps it, it could be records that you may want to do, donate. You may wish to donate your collection into the archives because you may feel that perhaps somebody can do research 
remembering that an archival institution is a research facility. It's not as a library where you can go in and browse and borrow and take away. You have to come in, you have to tell the person at the desk at the inner reference area what it is you want to do, what is your project, and then fill out the form, and then they will then present the records to you and guide you along, okay? We need to preserve these records, as I said before, and reference, as we know, is similar to libraries where you go in and you do the research. The outreach activities are activities that an archival institution will do to make the public aware of what is happening, what records they have, and things of that nature. This is just my, I just love to see how that was going. <laughs> <laughs> Where you identify what it is you think is archival, you make them, you preserve them, and then you make them available. Some people, they are so caught up with protecting archival records, they don't even want a fly, ooh, sorry, to rest on it. And they get into trouble. But you know, I guess they love for archives. I won't go into all the definitions. As I said before, you can always get a copy of, but acquisition, as I said, is just, getting the collection into, get, you know, acquiring collections into, to beef up your collection, or perhaps you may have records that may be slave records, and you realize that some other institution or somebody else may have some things that could beef up that the slave records collection, things of that nature. Appraisal really is determining, is this record valuable? Is it archival? Do we really need this? I want to say a little bit about disposal. You know, in the Trinidad Palance and in the English Dictionary, when you talk about disposal, it in throw away, get rid of. But in the archival world, disposal can also mean transfer. Transferring your records from one institution or from one area to another. It's not just destruction. Again, I will go in as it's just finding the value to see how valuable is this record? Is it really archival? And what do we get rid of? So you do an appraisal to determine these things. Arrangement. You know, in a library setting, you have, you catalog, you buy books, you catalog them, but it's different in an archival institution. You have to do arrangement and description. And arrangement, it doesn't mean if this young lady here, <laughs> has worked in the Ministry of National Security. And then she left and went to work in the Ministry of Education. And all those records were then sent to the record center. It doesn't mean that, okay, we know it's Susan Neverson, so we put in all Susan Neverson records together. No, it's not like that. You have to remember things, for example, the origin, you know, respect for the origin, and things like that, what the French call respect their form, F-O-N-D-S, respect for the origin of the document, so that those under education stays under education, those under national security stays under national security. So it's a whole different ball game. It's not like when you go into a library, all books on my pole are together, all books on Selva, no, whatever, or whatever, perhaps the subject, they are all the languages are together, it doesn't matter where they have come from, but it's different in an archival institution. And as I said, this. You see any other custom using these things? That's what happens. Press here and bring it on. Okay. Form. <laughs> <laughs> it's French. Let me go back a little bit. The French were the first people to really bring out the word archives and to even start to think about developing archival repositories. And it started around 1790s with the French Revolution. They were smart. They say, hey, we don't want at the end of the day, we didn't have a history. So let us keep all the records that are valuable to our country. And that's how archives started. On the other hand, records management, managing all those records came about around the 1940s with the Americans. And again, it was another hot time. It was around the Second World War in the you know, I mean, we know this Second World War started, the Depression, 1931, go on and ended at 1945. But 
around that time they realized, you see all these wars? At the end of the day, America have nothing. And you know, the America wants everybody to remember America. So let us manage these records so at the end of the day, we will have it. So the four French again means the whole collection. Okay? The sous four, for example, national security, all the records of national security. Then the sous four is when you divide them, human resource, accounts, and all the things like that. And the series, the records under your accounting records, you may have. Give me some accounting records. Or human resource. Accounting your salaries and things like that. The series, then the file, and then it goes on to the item in the file. Okay, so it's just a hierarchical explanation. Preserve. We need to preserve, as I said before, don't even let a fly touch the archival records. We need to preserve them and store them in the right environment. So these are some of the things that you will look at. Fire resistant environment. We don't want at the end of the day you just put the records any old way, and at the end of the day, there it's mold, it's mildew, it's cockling, it's just name it. And of course, security. That even let me go back a little bit. When we talk about records, most people long ago used to think it's just paper, but it's not just paper records. It's all media. So it's all the electronic records you use on the computer. It's all the other media, the DVD, the video, the the film, this, and to protect all of these, we need to have a disaster and emergency preparedness plan in place. We are now trying to formulate. Let me just grab some. Water. And these are the the initial response and the different things that we will look for. We don't want to end up like Haiti. You know, when we had the earthquake, fortunately, up to today, they are able to really fix up their libraries. So they, are, they have started using them once, once more. The archival building is up and running, but still, you know, they, they, are, they fund some of the funds that even people had dedicated it's not reaching the right area, so. But this was very, this was very traumatic. Another thing, a fire that can be very traumatic and all your records, if you don't have things in place. I mean, those natural disasters, it's not, you just wanna run for your life. You're not gonna stand up and think, well, you know, I have to save this record because you <laughs> need this, right? But at the end of the day, if we have a disaster preparedness plan in place, you know, at least we could run, but we know some things that all wouldn't be lost. The reference area that we are, as I said before, it's not like a library. You come in, you request what information you need. For example, if you go to, anybody has visited any of the national archives outside even the region? Okay, if you go to the national archives of the UK, I mean, all the cameras, you've probably seen half of them, would be on you. They're looking to see how much elbow you put on the book and things of, like that. So they're protecting it. So all these things have to be hiding up in the corners that you don't see. And they're bringing one document by one. You hardly see a whole list. You know, when we go to the National Archives, we're giving them everything. You want to see, and you know, treaty, they want to help, they give everything, but it's not like that. They're very, very particular. They will give you gloves that you have to put on and protect their archival records. Outreach, as I said before, the things you will do, the exhibitions, the publications, the tours, to let the public know. At the National Archives, when I used to work there, what we used to do, we used to have, we used to tell the schools in the areas and throughout Trinidad and Tobago what records we had and invite them to come in and do research. So when CAPE started, I was fortunate to sit on the history committee in Barbados so that, you know, I knew what was requested. I knew what primary documents they would need. So we were able to tell the schools and allow them, try to acquire them acquisition so that they could come now and do their research because before that 
no school and no school children not going to come and you not so half of you how many of you have ever visited the national archives <laughs> and it is not meant to embarrass anybody now a record center UTT needs a record center we need a record center we have a lot of semi-current records and even if you want to put the archival records in the record center until we can do better until we get the flagship whatever we should do that because what is happening is for want of a better word a record center really is where you store semi-current records eh? it's supposed to be low cost you're not going to spend a big set of money and you know the active records are where sorry that's okay the active records are what you will use on a day-to-day -day basis, so you will keep it with you. The record center is the place where you will send the semi-current records, until such time perhaps you may decide these records are really archival, so I'll send it to an archival institution, or I'll keep them for a longer period of time, or it has no value and they can be destroyed. These are the different features, commercial. Now, the only commercial record center that I know of is called is Chapman's nearby Fernandez Complex. And of course, Mr. Chapman's is getting, he's filthy rich now. Because he charges per square feet or meters a box. So at the end of the day, the, all the various ministries that are sending their semi-current records to Mr. Chapman, they pay thousands of dollars per month to have those records stored. You can go into the record center business, you know, make some money. All right. Or maybe UTT may decide we're going to have, we're going to get a cheap building or something to ensure that the environment is right and store our semi current records because it's very disheartening when people call me and ask me, you know, Mrs. Leons, what do I do? I'm not using these records on a day to day basis. What do I do with these records? And I just have to say, well, just keep them. You know, I might go and look at it and see what has value and what can safely be destroyed. But at the end of the day, how many boxes of records will you keep near your foot? These are some definitions, as I said, if you want this slide, you can look at these. It's just for, to help you. I want to talk about disposal again. As I said before, disposal is not only destruction. It's also transfer. So you may have records that you don't need on a day-to-day -day basis, and you may transfer it to some storage facility, right? First of all, before even doing these things, as I said before, you check, you appraise the records to ensure what value it has, because keeping everything, in that 10% could be more, but keeping everything is a no -go. You will You will be frustrated. What I tried to do in 2008 when I came here was to uh, draft retention and disposition schedule. That is very, very important. To have this schedule so that at the end, so that even when a record is created, you know one time this record will be a record that I would need at a later date. This record is archival because when you is an exam you know that your certificate or your degree you want to keep that right so that is considered archival you create records on a day-to-day -day basis and your email all the emails I have visited as I said or almost all the institutes and campuses and most people that I talk to have told me that every single email they have ever gotten they have kept at the end of the day, you know what is going on. The IT people have it hard. You will run out of space. So in the same way you treat hard copies, paper records, it's the same concept, it's the same principles you use, okay, with electronic records. So UTT has everything. All the admin staff has everything. Miss Samson may send something to her and it's, it's, I'm just using a reference, okay? To her admin assistant saying, remind me to go to meeting. I have a meeting with the president. She keeps that. 
and then maybe half an hour after she may say you know the meeting has been cancelled so it's going to be on Thursday she keeps that when things have been resolved you don't need to keep them okay so what really is records and information management it is a professional management of information in the physical or electronic forms. Management of these records I'm reading should start from the time they are received or created to their final disposition. It is a management of information throughout the life cycle of records. And the life cycle is like an organism from the time you're born to the time you die or you want to you want to preserve Tanti because you want Nenen and Tanti to live for as long as you could have them here on this God's gift earth. Okay? So the cycle goes on. You're using the information and then it is either destroyed or it is kept, maybe for a period of time, or you may find that it is archival, so you want to keep it forever and ever. What is a record? It's a document, and as I said, it's not just what's on a computer, it's any media and uh, the electronic records stored on the media information as we know that is knowledge that is communicated the communications department have been doing a lot of that so the concept of record keeping is the process of creating and maintaining complete and accurate <coughs> And that's a buzzword, the accurate records of business activities. You don't want to keep everything, and at the end of the day, you know, Professor Stout may want something, and then you're digging up the mm -hmm. volumes of emails, or maybe you have some files stored in a cabinet, and you're going through. And the next day, pass, she asks for, ask for it since Monday. Tuesday, you're still looking. Wednesday, you're still looking. Maybe by Thursday, you might find it, but by then, she might not want it. <laughs> so the major reasons for managing is it improves the service, you will be able to provide a good service. Reduces the volume so you don't find you run out of space and you don't know what to do. And it meets legal requirements, storage, and all these other things. So we have to control, all right? So the purpose of control is to identify, organize, Produce, these records produced by these record keeping systems or even if it's a done a written document. Some of the threats are, as I have a client here, unauthorized disclosure, malicious or accidental destruction, all the things they can, the viruses. You want to ensure that you have security on, in place, you have different things in place so that at the end of the day you don't hold your head and ball. Okay? So some of these strategies for strengthening the management of these records are have a plan. And you know, you may not know everything about information technology. We need to collaborate. We need to get together. We need to form committees or some group that we can sit together and really discuss things. We need to ensure that the records are registered. You know what's on your system. You classify them, whether it's putting them in, and to classify means putting them into groupings. You put all your accounting, accounting records together. You may put your human records, human resource records together. You know, classifying them into like with like. So that at the end of the day, you're not digging through. You're spending the whole morning going through all the records on your system. All right? Somebody is smiling, so like they know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And tracking, you should be able to know who, if it's a hard copy, who I give this file to. Who has it? Or who did I send this email to? Things of that nature. So I won't go back into explaining or the different. I'll send it to you. Develop, as I said, I can't stress enough how important a records retention plan and disposal plan is. Develop and implement a records retention schedule which covers all records, electronic, paper, any media. This will dictate which records are currently being used. 
It will say which records can be sent to some storage facility. It will say which records could be safely destroyed as you read it. Click, delete. It could say which records, you know, this, this is minutes of the meeting, of the board meeting. And later on down the road, we want to know what Professor Ramchan was talking about at the board, or what the new president, you know, we need to have so that you can do. And the thing about it is, if you don't know your history, how will you, you know, how will you um, carry on or act in the future? How will you be able to carry on the business of the organization later on? If you have no idea what went before, you have to be always reinventing the wheel. So develop storage and retrieval systems for records on all media so that information and records will be available at your fingertips. As I said, you don't want five days after you now, Joanne, now find a record that Dr. Williams asked the folk. I have noticed that, and this is not meant, anyway, let me see it. When I visited some, most of the organizations, you know, we, in UTT, we have people who came from the government service and know about filing, they know about classification, they know the importance of tracking, being able to track a record. There are some people who came in from private enterprise and never heard of that. But they try their best to do, to have some kind of method to their madness. But it is, it is madness because at the end of the day, if they go and leave, the person who comes after don't have a clue what it is. What, I'm, what I would like to see is an organization-wide records management system. I don't want a decentralized thing. We are Point Lisa is doing something, Ekiaf doing something, Omera doing something, John D doing something, and at the end of the day, we can't connect, okay? We have to really be cognizant of the standards in records management, and one of the most important ones is ISO 15489, which tells you about managing your records. If it can look like this. Now this is a mobile filing system and these are just for the paper records. You can also put, I mean, you can use some of like your DVDs, your CDs and usually people use these mobile filing systems if you don't have much space. It's easy to wind them and bring them together and so that you can have room to move around. Instead of all those cabinets, someone sent me an email recently asking about buying cabinets. How much cabinets are we going to buy? Where are we going to store them? You know, it's really, really, we, ha we really have a serious problem about space, so we have to think about, find a strategy how to move forward. This is the situation today. There are now legal consequences of retaining records too long. Okay, to get you in trouble. Severe legal consequences of deleting or eliminating records too quickly. The need to have a records retention program as part of a records management program is really, really very important. Many organizations want to keep records just in case. You know, I'm keeping this there because just in case. I feel I might need this, so I'm not gonna get rid of it. Or when they end up with so much just in case records, they start to delete or try to find ways to get rid of, or program or something may have ended, what do I do with all the records? And never try to have a retention and disposition schedule. So, any mini mini more, and you delete. Any mini mini more, burn. Any mini mini no, shred. And that's, you, you understand what I'm saying? So, one of the first things we do, we have a records inventory. And this is a complete and accurate survey. You want to know what records you have. You want to know where you have them. You want to know if it is in somebody's car trunk, if you give it to them. You want to know all these things. So you have an inventory. It is accomplished by describing, quantifying, recording all, you know, the whole movement too of the records. And it is really a nice working document when you decide to do a retention disposition schedule or when you check in on which records are vital. You know, there was an advertisement long ago about pricks 
our vital supplies. I mean, you want to have pricks all the time. All right, so we have to treat our records like pricks. They are vital. If we lose them, if anything happens to them, God forbid, we wouldn't even know that UTT ever existed. We wouldn't even know what went on at UTT. For example, a member of my staff, Miss Ali, we were trying, we are trying to have a records management manual so that at the end of the day, the administrative staff or staff that deals with records could have this manual and they will, it will guide them, it will have guidelines. So I asked her to do some research since she is history, she's doing her master's in history, to do some research on the history of UTT. I mean, I've sent the poor child to, to catch hell because a number of the records that will give you what UTT was when it was TT, Trinidad and Tobago, TTIT, have been destroyed. So you have to now try to recreate and use what little she had to create some sort of history. That's not right. We want to keep those things. Those things are vital. Okay. Okay. Perhaps. Okay. So then, so then, so then, Miss Hampson, we'll come to you and you will guide us. Okay. All right then. Thanks for correcting me. But you know, it was really, uh, you know, I felt sad. Okay. So these are some of our inventory methods. And the three stages are the questions that we will ask. You know, how long should the records be retained? How long should I keep these records around my foot? How long should I keep them on my computer? Okay. So as I said before, retention schedule is very, very important. The IRS, we know, natural disasters, human disasters, the deleting, the virus, the hacking. But if we put the right things in place, we won't be frightened. I want to move on a bit. So I'm just going to summarize now. Electronic paper and records of all media continue to grow, as we know. Every year, a lot of students come in. Okay, we have thousands of students. How, much, how many students we have now? About how many? Right, so we know we want to protect those students' transcripts. At the end of the day, they will come 15 years after and say they need that transcript. We want to know we protect the transcript so that we could give them, we could tell them, okay, you can collect it in two days' time. And in two days' time, they come, they have the transcript, okay? Managing records retention is, it is really one of the most important functions for which record <coughs> managers are responsible. It is important. And as I said before, we want to have a comprehensive organization-wide records retention program. And we have to regularly and consistently look at it. Whatever changes can be made, we change it. We don't want to have, as I said, every campus and institute doing their own thing. It's going to be really, really difficult. I know the IT department is doing a lot of good work. And I'm not an IT person. And I need to be educated in a lot of areas. But if we work together, we can really, it's not, it's not impossible. This is one of the an ideal record center will look like. And as I talked about the mobile shelving, if we have space, we could go otherwise. But you know, for lack of space, we can, we can be creative. And as I said before, vital records are like archival records. You want to protect it because at the end of the day, you want to know what was this organization, what was UTT doing all those years ago? Point, huh? Now this is a new TTA. Yeah? Okay. And I just 
it's the and it's not true no fault the workers have tried to store some of the records but because of lack of space because they're not taking the fact that they need record center facilities or, or record storage areas so they try their best and when rain fall this is what happens this was worse than this this was going all the way up to the ceiling and I started myself and my staff going through and looking to see what records could safely be destroyed. Now the exam scripts, not the transcripts, exam scripts we don't need to, if we have a policy saying a student can't query the exam after a month, why are we keeping all those transcripts? And there were, not transcripts, not transcripts, sorry, the exam the scripts, because, yeah. right? You don't have to keep those. So you know, that is why I said we need to do an appraisal, look at the records, think about what we're creating, and then decide when you know this doesn't need to be kept for such a long time. So when they run out of space, the poor child, they, they confuse what to do, just put it anywhere that we, where we can, it will be out of my face. So we want the proper environment. We don't want at the end of the day, there's nowhere else I looked. There's nowhere else to put this cabinet. There's no space because it's a person's desk. There's nowhere else to put this cabinet. But unfortunately, the ceiling, there's a leak. And I am sure, in fact, there were leaks going into the records too. So it's a frightening thing. And you know why I showed it? Because I want people to know that it's important. For too long, they're just saying, you see, when you talk about records, oh gosh, it's so boring. And... But it, it hits us back. Eh? When I worked in the government service, you know what was happening? People were retiring and they weren't getting their pension. Because you can't find the record. Remember, you have to recreate all where you work, have all the records so that they could compute your pension. And if you don't have it, smart. Crackle, smoke your pipe. You're not going to get your pension. And it's a sad thing because years ago, people died and they never got their pension. So that's dry to manage records was a you know a serious, serious thing. And I want our university to look at it that way and to do the same thing. You see? So when when there's a flood. The records getting wet, but there's nowhere else to put it. It's just one little room. There is nowhere else to put it. All right. So when we build in, make sure you have photo to space to store these records and to store them in the right environment so that this doesn't happen. Okay. Last year, November, the CABICA, which is the Caribbean International Council and Archives, we had a congress where 16 countries attended. And I was fortunate to be able to be a part of it and have workshops and to be able to talk to people and let them ask them questions about what are you doing to, how are you creating your records management system? What's happening with you? Tell me about the challenges, you know, because don't feel bad. We are not the only ones. We feel because a country may be bigger than ours, they don't have those problems. Some of them worse than ours. Okay, some of them now trying to start to have electronic or document management systems and it's teaching, you know, how, what to do, they make mistakes, they try another one and things like that. Now, Sharon Alexander Gooden, she is the record, she's the records manager in charge of all the records at UWI KFIL campus and this was, this is one of the presentations and I found it was so fitting, instead of reinventing the wheel, that we could share and look at and discuss and see. So I would like to share her presentation with you. Now they were looking for what, how, what software can be used. So at the end of the day, you want a record as of yesterday, you can pull it up. And the object, as she said, the objective provide, she's given an overview of the electronic docu document records management system at the University of the West Indies and what happened. Now, not a document management system. The document management system will just manage the documents and what you use on a day-to-day -day basis or management. it. So you, you want to have to use software that will do everything for you. All right? 
conduct and document business activities. It will do preserve the institutional memory. So at the end of the day, you know, it's stored properly somewhere on maybe an off-site location. And as you said, good record keeping ensures compliance with regulatory environment, accountability. At the end of the day, we want to know that we have those vital records and our responsibility to our stakeholders, responsiveness, good governance, good archives, and it provides all our needs. So in other words, we want a reliable and trustworthy system. Like UTT, UWI has hybrid records environment. They have paper, they have electro electronic records, they have multimedia. We have the um, Academy of Arts and Letters, and they do a lot of nice stuff at Napa. And all the videotaping communication department, they tape all the seminars, they have a lot of very interesting records. So at the end of the day, how are we going to manage the volume of records that are created regularly. So we want to know that we can, we want to have a hybrid system where everything would be, it's not that we put the electronic records one way, the paper, it can be stored in, a, in an environment so that any one of the records, whether it's paper, you know where it is. Creating and maintaining reliable and authentic records requires this. And as I said before, not a document management system. So you want to know that it captures the record, it manages the business process. Auditing, if the auditors come, we want to know that everything is there that is necessary. If it has been preserved in the right place, all the outputs are there. And these are the steps that they took. What they did, this whole investigation, they did an investigation of different systems, and it took three years. So it's not a, sh a quick fix. Okay, so that's why I said, don't feel bad, because these things take time. But if we start, we could get in the right place. It took them three years just to investigate which system they want to use. All right? They had to have senior management input. They, had to, they formed, in fact, an ICT committee, Information Communication Technology Committee, to, to even vet the request for proposals. They shortlisted and then dumped the two proposals. Then they selected Trim. All right? Trim, they said, incorporates the workflow management image management, all these things, email management. So you don't have to worry. With Trim, you will know which email you could keep, which email will be deleted, and things like that. Some of Trim's features, as I said, document and file, file classification management, metadata management, Boolean searching, integrated barcode technology, and transfer of corporate email through Outlook. And that's what we use. The implementation was done on a phased basis. The first two years, and it took the first phase, took two years. And this is what it targeted the registry office of the principal, the pro vice chancellor's documents, the administrative records, student affairs. They did a lot in the first phase for those two years human resource, and the finance departments because they felt those records, I mean, really, really critical, right? And then after the two years, they rolled out the, to the faculties, departments, institutes, centers. After the two years, they did that. In checking, in you know, the considerations, they had to figure out how many seats or users are required. How much money? That is a real thing. Thanks for coming. Yeah. How much money? Do we have enough money to really implement this? Because usually these things cost a lot of money. Huh? And jump, at, jump start services were the, included in project planning. So a lot of things went beforehand. Planning the whole project, the technical architecture review, configuration, the end user training. Now we don't want to 
put up a system and then get vexed because people don't want to use it. But they might not want to use it because they're not trained. We have to incorporate when we're spending our money, training for the users. Training even for the, the IT, not <coughs> IT, but you know, training. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because they need to know to lay with us, with the, to understand what it is we want, what records we want to be managed and how we want to use those records. The other course consideration was staffing. They had to get a dedicated functional systems analyst for an initial two-year period. They had to get money to train, records program, staff and other users, and some change management sessions had to be done to get buy-in, to say, well, yes, you know, this trend making sense. It will really help the university. They had to get consultants, additional, to, to look at and to assist them. But you know, you have to be careful when you're choosing consultants, right? Because sometimes they just want to come to the West Indies, some of them, mm -hmm. if it's outside, to go on the beach. <laughs> some pitfalls that she said you should avoid because they had problems with that trend. Problematic backfire conversions. You give the backfire conversion to a company and then they can't do it. They don't understand the local environment. And they do once on the crap, where you're done spending money, you have to pay them. Okay? And staff resistance. Some staff continue to request paper files. There's still then less paper being produced and then less excuses. I feel in better using this paper, you know, than you see this computer. This is stress. All right, and the IT support. IT support is very important because we need to ensure full IT support in terms of the infrastructure, in terms of securing the records, and in terms of backup. Some of the challenges was the complexity of the record types. More, which is model regulations. This was really formulated in the UK. And if you want to know more about it, it tells you what money you can use when you want to manage the management of electronic records. This is the URL. Now I just want to see some of the other records management applications that you may want. There are a lot of them. Eh? Some of them maybe not user-friendly at all. So you really need to ask people who have done put up a system and don't try to reinvent the wheel. So as I said before, remember, many organizations have gone through this process. Learn from them, don't reinvent the wheel, all right? We don't know, we just try, we want the best for our university. I thank you very much. Oh, prep quality assurance, yeah. Because we have external examiners, and these external examiners only come after a whole year. Yeah. 
so reckless that you may think two months, keep it two months. No, we need to keep it longer. So you know, persons like that, we could collaborate. I'm interested too, as you mentioned, there's certain standards that would govern our process. Mm -hmm. So if there are things uh, that are already established, we would like to sort of find out about those and not bring them to us, as you had mentioned. Yes, it needs to happen. So it'll save some time. So I guess I'll be in contact with you to sort of set up. Okay, so I can be Go ahead, go ahead. Oh, okay. You said there's serious legal consequences. That's what I wanted to do. Why? I mean, you can destroy a record in the, you know, question. Even if you know, it's in the record. I mean, what kind of consequences do you have? Because, um, hmm. I'm going back to my government days. It is. What an example can I draw? Is it a, a, a penalty or the, the fact that the longer you keep records, the more trouble you might get into where people discover things they should not have? Because I can't see keeping the record. It as a legal thing where there's actually a law. You can keep records only for so long and you'll be punished if you keep it longer. They can't keep records with, they say, like children who are underage. They keep their records, some users, so that they cannot be penalized as adults. Mm -hmm. Those are related or something. I can understand that. But that's a sweeping statement. I mean, to keep it, keep it long. Too long. Too long as it it, it really doesn't happen in a university setting, but more government. More Excuse me? Yes. Like, for example, in Ministry of National Security, with when, when we sat to book out their retention schedule, there were some records that they had to, they, because I can't go into the um, private things, because as, a, as the former government activist, I had to swear to secrecy to certain things. But there were records that had to be destroyed and it created, that's why I said I should have, should not have made the sweeping statement, but there were records in National Security, Ministry of National Security, when I sat with the Commission of Prisons and that had to be destroyed after a period of time. There were also records that you could not destroy. For example, um, accounting records, receipts, uh, vouchers, the regulation 6901 says seven years, but in speaking with the, the lawyers at Ministry of National Security, they were saying that when cases, you could not destroy those records because cases sometimes are not resolved. A simple thing like, I'm just drawing a simple reference, like maintenance, and they weren't, at that point in time, they weren't taking a copy you had to have the original to prove that you paid maintenance. And that was years ago when I sat with them. You had to have the original so that it was a legal, how should I put it? It was, it, you could have been penalized if those records were destroyed. And in the same way, there are other, there are other well, because documents of national security as I law they have a certain period that they cannot be released to public viewing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but because... It's a certain period of time, mm -hmm. without certain five years, you could... It's 30 you know, years for the... Whatever it is, could be published, you know, and people mm -hmm. would ask, start asking questions on that. For example... So if you're destroying those records, then... For example, no, for example, the um, cabinet minutes. Every week, cabinet <coughs> send their records, I mean, to the National Archives records that the ministers with all the little squiggles and notes and things, but you, the public weren't allowed, and still, that still obtains um, Rebecca until after 30 years. Yeah, so that's 30 years, so it's the same thing. I, uh, mm -hmm. so, uh, uh, as we are talking about this, I wanted to ask your opinion on this particular issue. The issue of confidentiality, mm -hmm. when People who should not be holding records ask for and receive access to certain records. Mm -hmm. For instance, right here at UTT, 
I know one staff member requested all of the admissions records for a particular program. And this is regardless of whether the people had been accepted by UTT or not. Now those applications, as far as I'm concerned, are people's names, addresses, dates of birth, uh, signatures, okay? And when ordinary individuals request those records, there is no uh, confidential. There is also no protection of storage. So when people request things like this and take them back to their office, um, anybody could then access it because they, they're not swearing to protect. In most cases, people don't know that they have the records. And what bothers me about this is if I made an application to an institution and I was even accepted, I would be highly annoyed to know not only that that institution kept my records, but made my records available or allowed people to have my records who have no, no whatsoever. So I think UTT needs to establish, a, a, what is it called again, not a, not a chain, of something where people should not be allowed to take certain records from their, their storage point. And that is something that, in the, that I know of the government archivist institutes. Because as the government archivist, the, not the government archivist, sorry, the university archivist institutes. Mm -hmm. Because at the government archivist could, in spite of the fact that the Freedom of Information Act left out retention schedules and people feel the freedom of information and everybody could come and see it, has the authority to say, no, you cannot disclose this record so that well, you understand and things like that. And UTT should have, but... Well, as the university archivist, I think you need to, to do something about that. Yeah. But anyway... Can I just make a point that it is you? In terms of understanding what obligations UTT has in terms of freedom of information, remember UTT is somewhat public. So if the person um, made a freedom of information request for certain documents, it might be the university policy to allow it. But I'm getting from you that it's not a freedom of information. No, it's not a freedom of information. That's not public information. Secondly, UTT has data protection obligations. So in that instance, UTT has breached. I would say so. And, and it has to be implemented. I would say um, yeah. I would that say it, it has to be implemented, but, yeah. but, but a lot of people you cannot, you cannot, for instance, if I apply to a bank for credit card, mm -hmm. nobody could have the Freedom of Information yeah. Act could ask that bank yeah, for no, credit card. That is true. That, that is true. Because because some things don't only fall under you the Freedom of Information Act. Exactly. Your information under the Freedom of Information Act. In which case, I would have supplied But I think that's that's. The lack of liaison when you go to the office and having a, a, a because, as I said, I pointed I out so. some of the that yeah. Yeah. some of the laws, but UTT doesn't follow it. But that's a serious breach. That's a, that's a, that's a serious a breach. Persons, uh, an individual's personal records could be sacrosanct at any institution, and certainly at a bank or mm -hmm. a university. I mean, I, I can't believe that anyone, anybody coming off the street. I mean, if somebody no, gets it was it was it was no. <laughs> but excuse it's me, it happens. It happens. It happens. It happens. No, no, I'm as, as a principal, you cannot let that be a public document. Yeah. Yeah. But it happens. But I think that goes back. I mean, at the point where a record is created, where that um, needs to be established, in terms mm -hmm. of who gets it, 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 who gets you must have authority. I mean, if you're an official and you, can, you have a case to go into a document, well, then you have to prove that. But also, we have a case. We, what I'm talking about is I'm not even talking about somebody borrowing records to look through them. I'm talking about even wanting to maintain a parallel record storage with people's vital information in it. No, that's breach of the information. I think so. I don't and this think is, no, you don't have, have to think it is. It is. So you can give not yes, anything that's horrible because it's 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 it's, it's, it's um, making them very vulnerable. But anyway, let us come off this. We can discuss this out. What I wanted to mention is with software packages like Trim, mm -hmm. 
I am thinking that trim has to be trained because there's no way that trim could um, make decisions about which email messages could be kept and which could not be kept. No, they yes. wouldn't be able to. And that that's why they have to collaborate. Yeah. Yeah. That, I'm not talking about the personnel using trim now, you know, I'm talking mm -hmm. about trim itself. No, the software, the, the software could be configured. So you tell the Right, the, but, but the actual word is trained, not just configured. It has to be trained, taught like you would teach a, a person. No, but yeah, you can program. Class. But, but that is a, that is a, a iffy, iffy, iffy thing. Because I've used trim. Speed. Let me tell you, I've used trim and um, at the national audit of the and, well and we had an experience. It's, it's an excellent, excellent package. Well, it can't fit you. We see the thing. So it can't fit. But as I said, we we use a friendly and it has all the security. The security. That no, but I'm just thinking that um, there are so many permutations and combinations in terms of. The type of and category of email. You see what and happens. could use, I imagine, phrases and key phrases. No, but separate from that, when, um, let's say you're using your organizational emails or whatever, you would attach certain metadata. So when people are sending emails now, you would let them know that when they're sending an email, they should attach certain metadata to the email. Oh, I so see. when it comes in, the software reads that it, it, it's on the paper from So it's streamlined. Yeah, but it's, 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 it seems as if you have to obey it. It wouldn't work with any personal email. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to have to work with my personal email. But when a personal email comes in, it would flag it up as a personal email. It would flag it up as a uh, so email that, that doesn't have metadata. Mm -hmm. And when you receive it, you will attach necessary metadata. <laughs> Uh, yeah. so, yeah. okay, I'm just more the nuances of speech and language that we put into a direct But that's technology is technology. Yeah. Yeah. Technology is technology. Technology, 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 technology,